Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Patton McDowell, and in addition to podcasting, I'm a leadership coach, a mastermind facilitator, a best selling author, and a speaker. I love taking these nonprofit leadership topics on the road or into your Zoom room. If you need someone for your next conference or workshop, check out my new speaking page at patentmcdowell.com for more information. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation with Kevin Briscoe, who is the managing partner of CFO Selections. It's a company based in the Seattle area of the Pacific Northwest, but it's serving many businesses and organizations, but many nonprofit organizations in particular all over the country. They provide fractional CFO and accounting services. But what makes Kevin's insight so valuable is that not only has this company served so many nonprofit organizations, he has personally been involved with multiple nonprofits on the board of directors, and he understands the realities you're dealing with. He's seen all sides of the conversation around cash flow and risk management and budget planning and donor relations and all of the things inherent to nonprofit leadership, but sometimes can be a bit challenging or even intimidating for those of us that have come through uh, a journey to nonprofit leadership through the program side or maybe fundraising. Well, Kevin has a great ability to translate these financial terms and topics for those of us who may not have the same financial literacy, and he's going to help you understand what you can do to get better. Don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode. It's number 177. Just go to the podcast page at PattonMcDowell.com, and you will find all of the resources Kevin and I discuss. And by the way, CFO Selections has a wonderful collection of resources at their website, CFOSelections.com. Uh, Make sure you check that out and you can see more about the work that Kevin and his team are doing. You'll also want to check out episode number 141. Kevin's colleague, Dave Lennox, who leads the Voltus Group, is also another valuable asset to your learning about nonprofit leadership. And you'll understand more when you check that episode out. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Kevin Briscoe. Kevin, thank you for joining me on the path. Wonderful to be here, Pat, and I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm excited about this conversation, Kevin, because these are topics that are really relevant to not just current nonprofit executives, but aspiring nonprofit executives who, in some cases, I think are a bit intimidated. I'll put myself up as an example. I was a program guy in the Special Olympics world, and so I knew the leadership for me, was going to require a better understanding of the topics that you and I are going to discuss right now. Um, Let me start with this question. You work with lots of organizations, nonprofit as well, through CFO selections. What are some of the biggest challenges you're seeing right now? Yeah, we do. Uh, And it's a great question, Patton. Uh, I would say right now, uh, perhaps more so than ever, defining what recurring revenue and revenue sources are going to look like in the near to mid term is an enormous challenge for almost every nonprofit organization. And the reason I say now uh, more than in normal times is because almost all of the fiscal federal fiscal stimulus programs are exhausted and you've gotten what you're gonna get and your ability to include that as a part of serving your mission and how you go about that is really all in the rearview mirror at this point. We're having to go back to the period of time where developing revenue sources to serve our mission focus is all within uh, our own means and we're not getting help from anybody else. So it, number one on the list that I hear when I'm talking to these organizations is how we uh, ensure that we're in a position that we can continue to serve our mission focus. Um, secondarily, and it's a really close second, I would say, uh, and this won't seem revolutionary to anyone, is is focused on staffing. Right. Um, That's certainly true in the finance and accounting space, too. Uh, The unemployment numbers I read about nationwide are in the 
one to two percent range it's really crazy uh, i've been at this a long time <laughs> and it's it's <laughs> it's the most challenging i've ever seen it it really is and that yeah. translates to nonprofits, kevin right and the difficulty in hiring talent in the finance space is that in particular yeah, what you mean absolutely that's what i mean and i the, the reason i maybe hedge that a little bit is i think it's true in every facet yeah of the right. organization but right it's particularly true in finance and accounting well, and let me go back to your first of those two great points. Um, I guess the risk for many of us is that our our last year's numbers or last 12 months numbers could be misleading, right? If they were influenced by those federal stimulus dollars. Without question. Uh, and the simple fact is you probably experienced a period where revenue sources were down and yet you were fine from a cash management standpoint because you had these stimulus programs to support you. And in the world of fund accounting, that can be a little tricky to tease that out of your financial information. Um, and it's really important that that uh, an executive director be able to focus in on that and decide what's real and recurring and what do I need to make up and find new sources to try to try to support. Yeah, such a good point. And I've had some fundraisers come to me with that exact concern that they worry their bosses might continue to expect uh, uh, additional, uh, you know, metrics or goals above last year when last year was not right. supported by, you know, recurring dollars. That's right. Uh, but, yeah. well, Kevin, you've been successful in the corporate arena in many arenas, in fact, through your business and business says, uh, talk about your journey that brought you to CFO selections and in particular, your, your emphasis on nonprofit. I know not completely, but a lot. Yeah, no, sure. It's, um, uh, it goes back a ways. Like I said, I've been at this a while. I was fortunate enough to start my career in um, the public setting, um, worked in a Fortune 100 environment, uh, notable only because uh, I learned a lot about how to be a good financial manager and executive. Uh, <laughs> right. I, also, I also learned relatively quickly it was not the lifetime career choice for me. <laughs> I moved, moved on into the sm small to mid-market space relatively quickly and relatively early in my career. Uh, I have not looked back from there. Uh, after a uh, about a decade long stint as a business owner, uh, I was having, quite frankly, the same challenges that our consultants were running into. It was a life balance challenge. Uh, I'm not actually the founder of CFO Selections. Uh, There's a fellow by the name of Tom Varga who launched the idea. I uh, joined the organization, though, only five years into its uh inception as an organization and his philosophy at the time was uh you know we're going to go after tenured financial executives who are really not ready to be done and retired but are really tired of the 70 plus hour work weeks that so many executives get caught up in what i like to say is it relates to that becoming our nonprofit focus as an organization is quite frankly the nonprofit folks uh in this world are the originators of the leverage of talent if yes, you will yes and yes that that group of organizations uh i think conceptually got there before we did uh many many organizations have been borrowing individuals and what i mean by that is maybe getting two or three days a week from them and letting them go work elsewhere we've taken that concept and truly professionalized it and it really lends itself to the nonprofit setting. Now we're we're a broad form organization. We serve all different kinds of companies, but the nonprofit sector is our largest sector um, from a revenue generation standpoint. And it has fit well with us organizationally, not just because of the fractional alignment, but what a lot of these executives that I'm referring to who are ready to find more life balance do with that balance is they devote their time to philanthropic endeavors that are important to them. Nice. And our organization really followed along with that initially by establishing our own foundation, um, which has now been in place for 13 years, but uh, by you know affording them support when we can. So our primary focus as an organization goes to fund the efforts of our foundation. However, we do try to step in most importantly by affording our team the time and capacity to go devote time to their passion projects and in many 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 cases those are philanthropic organizations 501s of every ilk you can imagine that they're spending time with yeah i love that and and again i know you'll help us unpack it so in, in other words i can perhaps have a frankly a higher caliber uh, 
finance and accounting professional than I could afford otherwise, because I've, you're fractional. Explain again what a fractional CFO is. No, happy to. Thank, thanks for the opportunity to clarify that a bit, Patton. So um, we have kind of some minimum thresholds that we look for when we're looking for talent. 20 plus years executive experience. Now that comes from a variety of areas. Uh, and I would say most of the folks we get are coming from uh, for-profit endeavors. But the interesting thing about that, and as it relates to the nonprofit world, is many, many, many of them have served on nonprofit boards. They've been finance committee members. They've been treasurers uh, of nonprofit organizations. They actually come with a fair amount of nonprofit experience, but it's not what they have led with career-wise up to this point. Right. We give many of them an opportunity to translate those strong executive skills that they've learned over decades of um, learning and leading organizations to give them a chance to work in the nonprofit space. And again, uh, those those things kind of coalescing are a part of why the nonprofit focus has become so significant for us. It really just blends well. Yeah, I love that model for a lot of reasons. And again, what I think historically I've seen, or I, let me ask you the same question, Kevin, organizations typically will try to hire to the extent they can um, I guess the assumption is I need a full-time finance person, but yes. what do you see or, or what are some of the risks inherent in that I've got to hire it myself mentality? Well, I, th I think the biggest challenge is for many organizations is you try to pack too many different skills into the same individual. Uh, every organization in the nonprofit space has a board that they're reporting to that are generally fairly sophisticated capable individuals who operate at a fairly high level and you've got tactical work that's the practical reality of how you run any organization you're doing accounts payable and accounts receivable and somebody's got to generate the invoices what many organizations make the mistake of doing is saying i can get all of that in one individual and they're going to be successful at all of it even though you have a range of skill that could be done by a staff accountant out of school and is also needed to have 20 plus years of experience to liaise with your board. Right. What we've done is recognize it's it's much easier to try to find that in multiple individuals and take the piece of it that you need to serve your organization. And as a consequence, you get the best of both worlds. Right? Yeah, I love that. And I, I take it that you adapt to whatever staffing model is in place. In other words, they have no one or they have someone who perhaps is more junior and then you're your fractional CFO would would kind of supplement areas that they're not equipped to handle? Absolutely. Um, we like to think of our services as very a la carte. Um, yeah, yeah. We haven't mentioned it, but I will offer, we have a division of bookkeepers, accountants, senior accountants that pair with our senior executives on many, many engagements. Uh, it's not uncommon for uh, an organization to maybe take a day a week out of that uh, senior financial executive to meet the needs of those higher level elements of the organization and then have a day or two of that accounting level person. Maybe it's a professional bookkeeper. And the good news is, and this is where the a la carte feature comes in, organizations may already have the bookkeeper and accountant. Right. If they do, that's right. great. We simply collaborate as you described with them. So at a high level, talk about that range of, of, staff uh, talent or function from a CFO, I guess, being at the top of that ladder to just an accountant, or perhaps I'm misusing the terminology, but you hear terms like a controller, uh, an accountant, a, a bookkeeper. What do those functions at a high level do? Yeah. And where, where, how should an organization approach that? No, again, great question. Happy to happy to comment on that. Maybe what I'll start with is the distinction between CFO and controller. You hear you yes. hear those terms uh, kind of thrown out there, and in the world I live in, there actually is a distinction between them. They they tend to get muddled together depending on uh, what someone's experience with those roles is. Um, the easiest way I like to think about it is analogizing, you know, the the focus of those roles. Uh, controllers tend to be what we refer, if you think of your business as a, you know, four-sided box, you've got a building that you're operating inside of. The controller's activities are generally walls in and rearward facing, meaning they're working on compliance elements. They're working on things that are really generally focusing on 
what the organization has done and how it's performed, and then uh, making sure that compliance elements, government entities, uh, your third party audit that's happening, all of those things are happening as a consequence of what a controller would tend to do. Contrast that with the CFO, they are walls out, forward looking, yeah. meaning concentrating on where the organization is going, looking at things they ought to be anticipating. Um, it's it's easy to visualize that in a um, public company setting because that CFO is the one that's talking to the shareholders, right, and right. talking to to lenders that they're borrowing money from. In the nonprofit world, it's it's a role that can often liaise with donors. It can liaise with grant funders, right? It's it's similar activities. The point is, it's it's looking outside the organization and trying to uh, think about how the business operates. Let me extend that down past. Uh, that into more of the staff level positions, whether you call it a staff accountant or a professional bookkeeper, uh, they are doing the more tactical work that every organization requires. I mentioned a little earlier, accounts payable, accounts receivable, creating invoices, developing an initial draft of the financial statements, getting things together so that you have some facet of reporting on what's happening in the organization. The simple fact is every organization operate efficiently needs some level of all of that right and what we try to do is again offer an a la carte solution to give you what you need no more no less and it's going to vary for every every organization yeah it's fantastic kevin and again helpful i think to a listener who knows that someday if they're not already they're going to have to manage these functions and perhaps not be expert like your team brings expertise but they're gonna have to know enough about it to manage it right and to very true i guess be comfortable with that uh, arrangement uh, a couple other questions while i've got your expertise literally here in the zoom room um what are some of the compliance functions that that are particularly relevant to nonprofits where 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 can that go wrong or what what do you mean by compliance if yeah you sure well, I, I think the the one that everybody thinks about, which is a which is a real compliance component, is once you're north of a million bucks in in annual revenue, you're in a position where you're required to be audited as a nonprofit. And managing through that process with a certified public accountant, which is not what we do. I'll make a distinction in saying that we are not independent as an organization. We act as an advisor, and it's an important. Uh, distinction between what we do and a public accounting uh, group does. They are offering opinions on the organization. As a consequence, they are required by uh, virtue of their licensure and their ethical rules to be independent from the organization. Somebody has to be able to manage and interact with the organization that's doing that. And that's one of the things compliance related that we can help with. Right. Beyond that, however, there are, you know, all kinds of tax compliance entities, <laughs> all kinds yes, of yes. operating compliance entities, unemployment organizations, um, uh, uh, labor and industries, uh, all of the payroll related elements. Those are all compliance elements that go along with things. And then um, in some cases, uh, nonprofits have reporting requirements to banks for lending arrangements and things of that nature. That's another compliance example where you're supporting uh, what the bank needs uh, by provide, generally providing them financial statements, sometimes borrowing certificates, things of that nature. Those are all compliance elements. Um, broadly stated, you can almost think of accounting as a compliance role, period, but yeah. Yeah, I was trying to make a distinction <laughs> between the forward-looking CFO and-, and You, you explained it beautifully. <laughs> and but one other point of clarification, uh, uh, Kevin, are there different levels of audit required? In other words, I hear of nonprofits talking about the expense related to an annual audit, yeah. um, do I have to do those some minimum level of annual audit, and thus I'm gonna have to simply pay what it requires? Uh, <laughs> the short answer is yes. You're gonna have to do it if you, yeah, you meet right, right. you meet certain criteria. However, um, one of the things that um, we are often able to do is to mitigate that expense to the public accounting firm because we can bring a set of financials that are more prepared for audit great point and what the public accountant might otherwise have to deal with they will generally as organizations do as everything they possibly can to get the organization through the audit process and get an opinion issued so that you've met your obligation um, for federal reporting but they often prefer if they can have a clean set of financials and get through it quickly they've got 
you know, other organizations they want to get onto. And they're might help the cost too, right? They're very willing. And you know, as much as I think we're worth every penny a public accountant is, we cost less. <laughs> yeah, got it. Got it. I'm gonna underline that in my notes, Kevin, because that's good. But thank you again for explaining again some of these functions that again are, are a very real part of nonprofit leadership. In fact, let me ask you another one. And you talk about reporting is something your team in conjunction with the staff would be involved in. Talk about reporting to your board. I'm guessing you see all levels of, in other words, I go to some board meetings for nonprofits and they're getting, you know, huge stacks of paper. Others have more summarized, but any comments on what is best practice in terms of, you know, effective reporting to ultimately who is our boss, right? The board of directors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I would go so far as to say that a responsible financial executive is anticipating beyond what the board might need and really looking at uh, an area we haven't talked a lot about, Patton, which is organizational risk and the okay. things that are associated with uh, potential pitfalls that an organization might be dealing with down the road. The financials are, of course, a part of that, right? That's something that um, every organization has to responsibly steward. It's why, you know, most organizations, as they scale, they have finance committees that focus on that facet of the organization, managing the costs and expenditures and all of the things that go into uh, managing a financially healthy uh, organization. But beyond that, quite frankly, there are a variety of areas that uh, a financial executive will lend itself to. I'm going to use the term CFO because I think it's it's uh, aligned with this in that forward-looking sense that I mentioned. But um, looking at insurance and how the organization is underwriting its risk there, looking at um, performance objectives for the organization if they if they have maybe some retail component where they serve the public, there are metrics right. around how that operates that um, your CFO should be. Uh, looking at and judiciously putting in front of the board to give them some insight into how the how the organization is performing and then maybe most importantly is looking at six to eight to nine well i'm just gonna say as far down the road as you can comfortably yeah, yeah. <laughs> giving giving the board some insight into what's coming down down the pike now that part of that's a a cash forecast of course you know are, are the assets of the organization sufficient to meet the obligations of of the budget for the year, um, but beyond that, um, are there unexpected things that have happened to me that have changed the outlook for the organization? Oh, I don't know. Say a pandemic comes along, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> sadly, we have a real example there, don't we? Those curveballs happen, unfortunately, and we don't know what the next one will be. But uh, the financial executive for a nonprofit will be instrumental in making sure that the business can responsibly manage those, whatever it is. Yeah, love love that explanation. And it strikes me, I know I'm generalizing, but I would say most organizations, of course, are looking backwards, right? Their reports reflect activity that has mm -hmm. happened to date or by some period. But you're saying the best practice, of course, is looking forward. The cash right. flow and or risk management. If we're growing, if we're changing, if we're moving facilities, we're adding people, you're saying all of these functions should be part of kind of what we should be sharing with the board. Very true. You know, and I, I would go so far, Patton, as to say that uh, one of the things that is a pitfall for, for a potential nonprofit leader is to minimize the importance of strong, forward-looking financial management on the organization. Wow. I think for, for lots of good reasons, uh, particularly early stage executives are concentrating on how do I leverage the assets to the mission of the organization? That's not a bad thing, right? It's what they it's what they absolutely should be focused on doing. But what ends up happening is you end up restricting the focus of uh, what can be an important tool to make sure that you have a longer runway and the ability to serve your mission years into the future. It's a give and take no matter what you do. And I, I, you know, be remiss if I didn't say, well, of course, finance and accounting is important. I get that there, right, should, be, right. there should be pressure on that too, but don't overdo it is ultimately yeah. my message. Remember that it is an, a really important tool for you to be able to see where can I go in the future. Kevin, when you arrive at an organization, again, nonprofit in the context of our conversation, do you find certain issues with their systems, the infrastructure, uh, the software that they're using, the equipment, um, and I guess you adapt to whatever they have, or is 
much of your work done independent of what they have. Again, I'm thinking if I'm a listener, you know, do I need to invest more in my systems yeah. and wonder what you're seeing? No, it's a, it, it, another good question, Patton. And I, I would tell you different organizations approach that differently. The way we go about it is we adapt to what's there. Um, now, I would tell you on occasion, although this isn't common, sometimes what we discover is the systems are simply so poor that you can't manage the organization. And our, our early advice is we've got to concentrate on improving our data gathering capability to put ourselves in a position so we have good information to make decisions. Um, generally speaking, there's a framework there, although I will tell you that we are occasionally asked to help a nonprofit get started from day one and move forward, in which right. case we, we get right. to help make the decision. What's a good uh, framework for you to be able to manage this business? And the good news is there are uh, some relatively inexpensive tools that particularly in the early days of the organization are more than sufficient to serve the needs as it's getting out of the ground and really just getting started in life to serve whatever its mission purpose is. The more established organizations generally have something and we can adapt to what's there. And invariably, I would say, uh, and I don't mean this arrogantly, but the tenure of our team tends to find ways to improve those things relatively yeah. quickly. Um, I figured that's where your expertise comes in, right? And right. experience. That's um, right. Well, let me make the obvious statement that much of your work can be done virtually. Are, are there pros and cons of a, a virtual kind of CFO structure or do you all try to make some face-to-face -face kind of in your line of work you know it's it, it it's i have an evolving answer to that patent <laughs> so that's fair that's fair <laughs> we uh once upon a time we were um maybe as enamored as most small organizations with the opinion that uh an in-person presence was an important part to uh stewarding an organization and if there's one thing the the pandemic really illustrated for us is that work can still be done and be done pretty effectively if it's done dynamically. So I would tell you, we have a very hybrid approach. Yeah. Uh, yep. we, we do believe that some organizations can be served very effectively in a purely remote manner. Um, the tools are available to be able to do that and do it effectively. Um, and candidly, lots of lots of boards have moved to that and they've stayed virtual for for no other reason. It's convenient. Agreed. Saves money, right? But uh, there are occasions when an in-person presence is is clearly what's necessary in order to meet the needs of the organization. If that's the case, we do that as well. Yeah, so. and but again, you're based in Seattle, but you're serving organizations all over. Talk about literally yeah. the range of service or geography territory you're serving. Yeah, and interestingly, we are uh, nearly nationwide at this point. Now, we're not yeah. working in all 50 states, but we will entertain opportunities in nearly all states. Um, and uh, again, occasionally what we run into is there's there's a requirement for, a, for an on-site presence. And while we might be able to get somebody on a plane, it tends to be cost prohibitive. Um, right. Right. But when, when a remote resource is... Uh, I'm going to say sufficient, but we try to be a little more effective than that. Uh, if uh, if it looks like it's going to work, we embrace the opportunity to try to be of help. Um, we're not the only group that does fractional work like this nationwide. There are, there are many out there that do, um, but I do think we are one of the rare ones that focuses on the nonprofit space. And our expertise, uh, I th I think, is um, right up there with anyone who is serving in that space. Yeah, it it is impressive based on my observations. Uh, and and roughly what percentage of your work is in the nonprofit space? Would you say, Kevin? Oh, in the aggregate, you know, depending on the market we're in, it's anywhere from fifteen to twenty percent of what we do. Which I mentioned, we were a broad line service, so the next closest is less than ten. <laughs> so know, it's a big, it's a big, a big piece part of, your, of what we, yeah. a big part of what we do. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let me jump back into uh, among uh, several of your expert areas. Um, cash flow strikes me as something that nonprofits need to focus on as it relates to grant projections, of course, overall uh, planning. Anything else related to the fundraising aspects that you've seen or where your team kind of gets involved there? Uh, well, certainly uh, the reporting associated with the work in that space. It, and I've I, Maybe I don't want to be presumptive. I was about to say it's a given, but <laughs> yeah, well, you never know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, the simple fact is 
depending on where the money's coming from, from a grant standpoint, there's almost always a compliance factor that goes into reporting on what you've done with the funds that have been awarded. And or there may be a requirement to uh, uh, send what we'll call anticipatory reporting, where you're mm -hmm. essentially sending a budget to say, here's how I intend to spend it before the funding happens. In both cases, uh, we're going to be generally intimately involved in helping to provide that information. And more importantly, putting the organization in a position where it can comfortably and easily grab that information when it's required. Yeah. Uh, there's, I, I would say many, many, many of your listeners have been through the exercise where they weren't prepared for the request. And you can probably get it done, but it's a scramble. Uh, when you Indeed. know, when you know, the reporting is going to be necessary, there are absolutely ways to be prepared for that in advance. Well, kind of like you said, your team helps prepare for an audit. Your team would also help anticipate, I'm guessing, kind of particularly institutional funders who require somewhat right. extensive reporting. Uh, it sounds like you you would build in processes for that and or help generate the reports necessary when the funder comes calling. Well said, Patton. Anytime you want to come sell for me. I, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm a, I'm a good listener, Kevin. And uh, what you do is, uh, well, and again, I use my own example because I've, I've kind of tried to learn on the finance accounting side. I was a program person. I was a liberal arts major in college. Um, and I guess it leads to the education because, again, there are others like me who came through a different part of the nonprofit organization. They don't you know, have the built in experience like you and your team have. So are there certain things people like me can do to train? I mean, I guess we can always go back and take coursework in finance and accounting or in my case, I went back, and got an MBA eventually. But I wonder if you have you seen examples or might offer advice in terms of professional development for someone who wants to kind of better understand this stuff. This is going to come off as a bit of a shameless plug, but <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm, going okay. to, I'm going to say it anyway. One of the things that we've seen uh, organizations that are well run and be successful with is they find partners that can help their leadership, help augment their leadership skills. It's not uncommon for incredibly capable and dynamic nonprofit leaders to not come from a finance background. Right. Uh, right. It's, it's really not uncommon. And as a consequence of that, it's an area that needs to be shored up. Now, in some cases, and this is a, this is a great avenue to do this, sometimes there'll be a board member that's willing to devote some time to mentoring in that space and to helping assist an executive with their understanding of what's happening in the organization. And it's often volunteer time. So when yeah. you can get it, when you can get it, you want to take advantage of that. Um, what I was going to offer, though, and this is the shameless plug part, is, of course, if you can have access to an executive that's a part of uh, one of the resources you're bringing to bear, that's their that's their job is to highlight for the nonprofit leaders what's important, what should they be focusing on. And building a partnership like that is something every leader in every organization should do. Um, I, I happen to come from a finance background. My degree was in accounting. That's the way my career evolved. Uh, and even in my own organization, I have a CFO yes. <laughs> that, <laughs> right. lead, that right. leads that leads that work. Now, she, she probably doesn't love the fact that I can read the financials as well as I can, but <laughs> <laughs> but you still even, rely even on I, her too, don't you? Even I need the help, absolutely. Well, I, I love that. I wonder, do you all get um, involved in board level training? I, I'm I contend, Kevin. Let me preface this question with. There are a lot of board members who I don't think understand the financials as well as they might like, but they're afraid to ask. And so That's we have point. we have, you know, 20 people sitting around the table, but really only three or four can help interpret the numbers. So I, I believe we need to do a better job as a sector training our board. But do you all get involved in that or do you see evidence of that? You know, we we absolutely do it. It tends to be a part of the the larger scope of focus in in our engagements where we're providing service to the organization. And as a consequence of that, the interaction with the board highlights the fact that they need some education on how to take advantage of the tools the CFOs are putting in front of them. We we haven't actually historically, you know, put together a, a formal training program for board members, but it's an interesting idea. <laughs> I know, maybe that could be a takeaway from this conversation, because I think there's a, a genuine need. I think yeah. you tend to have, you know, your, your classic finance people around the table. Sometimes, though, they take over, and then you have the majority of the board just kind of going, 
you know, deferring to them. And I wonder if it's better for the organization. Everyone should have a basic understanding. And I also wonder, Kevin, about uh, the reporting to our boards, um, having, for example, an executive summary uh, or some narrative that helps yeah. explain things. Because otherwise, I think a lot of us are just eyes, you know, kind of glaze over. And it's, but do you see that or is that fair? Uh, absolutely. And I, I'll, I'll go so far. Once upon a time, I did billable work and worked with a handful <laughs> of nonprofit organizations. Yeah. And it was it was a significant part of what I produced in, you know, the materials that went to the boards, whether it was monthly or quarterly or however often I added a narrative to every one of the published reports that I went to. Because the simple fact is, to your point, Pat, and there are folks on that board that will get lost in the numbers. They've never exactly. read an income statement. They've never read a balance sheet. They don't they don't have any sense of how to interpret what those things are telling them. And it's the responsibility of that financial executive to put it in a framework that they can understand. And that nice. oftentimes simply means plain language, right? What does that mean? Like here are three things to look for, or what? What does that narrative it, literally it, help? Yeah, do? it might. It might be that. Uh, I I tended to use kind of a let's let's concentrate on what's happened, and I would highlight exceptions yes. to the financial yes. statements so that they could see from a performance standpoint. I would then have a forward looking element to say, and here's here's what's coming three months from now, six months from now, and if there were any notable developments that I was concerned about, those got highlighted as well. So. Your framework is is well said. A, a one page summary, you know, a dozen bullets maybe at the outside. Obviously, it's going to vary by organization what's really required, right. but um, keeping it succinct enough so that you can you can steer and guide to the things that you think are important. That almost always leads to questions and you know elements of uh, insight from the board where you're going to get drawn to what's important to them, right? So it's. It's not that that executive summary is sacrosanct starting point, right? Yep. Love yeah. that. I think you and I are definitely on the same page there. And, and in fact, you you bring genuine enthusiasm for this, Kevin, because I know you personally have supported many nonprofits. In fact, maybe you could talk about some that have been most important to you, either uh, historically or even now. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to lead with one that's very important to me, our own foundation, <laughs> which, which focuses yeah. on Good. foster youth. Right. It's I'm not actually a board member there. I simply participate uh, as the primary funding source. Um, but we have an independent board that, uh, you know, makes grant decisions. And that that's that one's thrilling for me. Independent of that, though, I, I sit on a nonprofit board um, uh, that's aligned with the University of Washington here in the Seattle area, uh, or at least once upon a time was. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, an organization that was originally set out to um, serve the mental health community with a training program that served a particularly troubled uh, group of individuals that suffer from a uh, uh, mental health diagnosis that's particularly challenging. Right. Uh, and in particular, I, I became associated with the organization. It was a client of mine initially. Um, I helped uh, helped it through a turnaround. It was a struggling nonprofit. You've never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> they did. They did have revenue sources, though, and they just weren't particularly well managed. Um, and so my uh, background beyond financial management to more operational elements, which is not uncommon amongst the folks on our team, uh, I was able to utilize that to really kind of right size the organization. It wasn't all staff adjustment. A lot of it was simply decisions about pricing and uh, how to manage costs and do some things that uh, are really core to the uh, uh, skill set of a CFO um, and maybe even COO a little bit. Uh, but uh, once it was turned around and on a path to a new level, we transitioned to another executive director and I moved on to the board. Um, that was 10 years ago. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, again, I, I knew from our previous conversations that you've had that you know, authentic connection to the nonprofit mission of many organizations. In fact, one, I guess, maybe in the final set of questions, Kevin, there's a lot of talent in your sector, the finance sector, that I bet some of your folks may, whether it's a, a retirement or semi-retirement going into nonprofit leadership, do you see that? Um, do you see opportunities for folks that have served your sector for years that maybe ultimately want to become a nonprofit leader themselves? Without a doubt. You know, uh, like I said, we've we've become particularly adept at uh, taking folks who have a fair bit of board service, but have never actually held the role of finance director or um, 
CFO inside a nonprofit organization, but they're they're familiar with fund accounting. Uh, and in many cases, the the skill set that a financial executive brings from the private sector or the for-profit sector translates incredibly well to the nonprofit setting. It's uh, a little tongue in cheek that I say this, but uh, I'll use this term every now and then. A debit is a debit. Every organization we go to, that's, that's <laughs> right. accounting to speak for. There's a common language in every organization. Fund accounting is different than typical for-profit accounting, but not so much so that the skills don't translate. And in lots of cases, those broader umbrella of risk management elements that we talked about a bit earlier, that's ultimately what we're trying to leverage into the nonprofit community. So we do have folks on the team that have been purely in the nonprofit sector their entire careers. They're incredibly talented folks, really, really capable, but we've translated a few uh, into organizations as well. I'll give you a great example of one is a current partner of mine uh, had been in the wireless telecom space uh, early in the days of what ultimately is now T-Mobile uh, for a wow. name that most folks use. Uh, he had also sat on the board and was the board treasurer for a private elementary school here in the Puget Sound region and uh, was open to the idea of serving a nonprofit organization. Um, we tease out those experience elements as part of the conversation. And we had an opportunity that really was a mentoring opportunity in a smaller nonprofit that serves, served, it was a legal foundation um, and served the legal community. And the executive director, I have to admit, she was a little, um, she was a little concerned because he didn't have a lot of depth. And I just said, hey, you know, the good news is if it doesn't work out, I have alternatives, but yeah, right, right. I, I think he's right. Um, uh, in particular, this individual, this partner of mine, has a uh, uh, master's degree in organizational development. <laughs> the 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 need at the client was organizationally related. They, that helped. Pretty, I liked his chances. <laughs> so, so I'm not always right about this, but this one happened to work out. Uh, she she gave him a shot. Uh, he served that client, I think, for seven years <laughs> before, before he moved on. And that that translatable skill set led him to all kinds of things beyond that initial element that he was serving. Um, that, fortunately for us, that long-term relationship, and again, it was a fractional thing. He was doing about a day a week for them. This was not a full-time right, gig. Right. It was about a day a week, and that day a week served their needs for that period of time. Uh, and uh, we enjoy many of those uh, kinds of relationships because particularly nonprofits, they don't scale 700% in a single year very often, right? They're right. relatively constant. So the idea of a long-term relationship is is pretty relevant and pretty common. It's a great example, Kevin. I appreciate you sharing that. And of course, yeah. it ties together a wonderful set of uh, suggestions and advice you've offered. I'm very grateful. I feel like I've, I've been through a finance workshop. Uh, you have helped, <laughs> and I know our listeners Pretty good, you're a pretty good student, Pat, and I'm telling you. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be better and pay attention, take good notes. And, and you you lifted up something, the, the mentor phrase, and I wonder if, I guess, in closing, any other advice for someone listening who wants, again, to be a nonprofit leader, they're going to have to to better master some of the topics you've discussed. But any other advice you'd offer someone who's yeah, thinking the, that along those lines? The, Maybe I'll pick up on that mentoring theme just because I think it's an important one and I think it works two directions. You know, we we concentrated our efforts on, uh, you know, I, say, I guess I would say managing upwards to the nonprofit leader who maybe has a skill deficit and needs some help and wants to learn. But it works the other direction, too. We hear fairly commonly um, organizations that come to us and say, I've got someone here who I think has the capability uh, and we want to see them grow into this financial leadership role. But the reality is if there's no one there to, to show them the way, yes. they're not going to get there, right? Right. And, you know, that comes to us in our hiring work as well. We, we do permanent placement work as well. And somebody will say, I want to hire, you know, a accounting manager and they can grow into the controller role. Again, that's not likely to happen unless there's somebody to help them understand I what it means teach to it. become a controller. Right? Yeah, so, right. That mentoring piece in, in the work that we do works both directions. And I think the thing that's maybe a little unique about us is the folks that are doing it don't have to be threatened in any way. Our, our folks have had their career for the most part. They're not looking for new jobs. Right, they're, right. They're there to help however they can. And if it's to steward the career path along of someone that's maturing into a role, they're they're more than willing to do that. And, and our model 
puts us in a position where if the work that we're doing is exhausted at some point, we'll go find them another client and they'll have an opportunity to work with a new organization. Perfect. Thank you, Kevin. Again, this has been fantastic. Lots of great takeaways yeah. for our listeners. And of course, if I can ask you for one parting gift, you know this request yeah. was coming. You but bet. How about a book? Book that's been meaningful to you that you'd recommend to our listeners? Yeah, as uh, I, I, we didn't talk about it a lot, but this kind of falls into the risk category. But and it's a, it's a common one to everyone. Uh, I've been I've been reading a book. In fact, I'm just about done. It's called Fire Doesn't Innovate, and it's about cyber management and threat management to cyber liability in in your organization. It's written by a gent by the name of Kip Boyle, who works here in the Puget Sound region. He's an outsourced virtual chief information and security officer of VCSO. Wow. For short. wow. Um, very capable individual. And he highlights why organizations need to be thinking about that in particular as a threat to take very, very seriously. Uh, if for no other reason, and as a financial guy, you'll know why this got my attention, the average cost of a ransomware attack on a small organization is $4 million. Good grief. Got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> and nonprofits aren't excluded from this risk, obviously. That's right, right Kevin. That's right. There, any anyone with money is at risk, and unfortunately, smaller organizations tend to be more at risk than you might imagine. Your your theory might be, I can hide. I'm a small guy; they won't find me. It's just not true. Yeah. The reality is, you're targeted maybe more so than the large organizations because you don't generally have the resources to manage it the way the big companies do. And while the reward may not be as big, it's big enough. Right yeah. there, we're, we're unfortunately all a target. So. Yep, um, uh, sobering but an appropriate reminder, and yet another takeaway. So, Kevin, thank you for that. Another good book to add to our uh, our reading list for sure. You bet, uh, Kevin. Where can people find out more about you and the great work you're doing? Hey, uh, online, like everyone else, www.cfoselections.com. Uh, or if your need is more accounting related, we brand that separately under a group called ASP. You can go to the, the ASPteam.com. Either of those will get you to us and we'll be happy to help. Yeah, Kevin, this is fantastic. Uh, we'll encourage our listeners to check out the show notes. We'll have links to Kevin and his various resources and businesses that certainly could help a nonprofit organization anywhere in the country. So Kevin, for all this, thank you again for joining me on the path. And thanks for having me. Really appreciate the chance. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Kevin as much as I did and came away with some practical idea to improve your personal financial literacy as a nonprofit leader and hopefully consider ways to make your organization more effective, especially as you are growing and considering staff additions. Don't forget about the show notes. They are available on our website, PattonMcDowell.com. You can find out more about Kevin and all of the resources available from his company called CFO Selections. As always, I'd be grateful if you would share this episode with someone else on the path. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. Go to the podcast page at PattonMcDowell.com and you will see the follow button. And you won't miss out on any of these weekly episodes, just like this one with Kevin every Thursday morning. If you like this episode, of course, click on that episodes button at the top of the page and you can scroll through thumbnails of all of our most popular episodes or you can search by topic or guest name if you want to zero in. Thanks as always for what you're doing in the nonprofit sector, especially right now. And keep up the good work for causes that are most meaningful to you. I'll keep bringing you content that can help you do it even better. Have a great week. I'll see you next time on The Path.